Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of RPGs with Paddy. I'm Paddy. So today we are going to look at something I have been very excited to start on, which is Cthulhu by Gaslight, uh, the second edition. I haven't been able to get my hands on the first edition box set yet, but as stated in the third edition, there were only minor changes between the first and second editions. So hopefully this will suffice. So first, a bit of background information. Uh, the second edition was printed in 1988, just two years after the first edition. It's 128 pages long with a pullout map of London. And it was written by William A. Barton and uh, editing by the famous Lynn Willis and Sandy Peterson. Uh, so the cover illustration, which I'll show you here, is by Tom Sullivan, uh, but the interior artwork is by Kevin Ramos. So in this book, there are four main sections. There's character creation, which is only seven pages long. England in the 1890s, 39 pages long. Uh, a bit of time travel, 11 pages long. And scenario suggestions, seven pages long. So if you've been doing your math calculation here, you'll notice that that does not add up to 128. There is also a, the main scenario in this book, which is the Yorkshire Horrors, uh, which also appeared in the first edition, but it was removed for the third edition. And this uh, scenario is about 45 pages long. Um, I will be reviewing the scenario, the Yorkshire Horrors, in a separate video so as to avoid any spoilers. So this whole video will be completely uh, suitable for players or um, keepers. So in the first section, we get character creation. Uh, there's a short uh, introduction, and after that we read about the importance of social class being separated into upper class, middle class, and lower class. And for the, these games, it advises to be middle or low upper class, as upper class, fully upper class, um, they have to uh, dedicate a lot of time to other matters such as socializing. And most lower class uh, people have to spend most of their time working just to survive, unless they're criminals. Um, although I personally, I think the lower class gives a uh, huge motivation to do something for money. Uh, the book recommends staying with mostly middle or possibly low upper class. Um, and social class affects your occupation. So there's certain ones you can't do based on your social class. Um, of course, it is possible to bend these rules to a certain extent uh, with the keeper's consent. And there are also some new occupations here as well. But just sticking with social class first, it can also affect your roles. Um, where your social class uh, in either direction might make you more or less trustworthy. So for example, um, lower class people might not be likely to trust an upper class person and equally uh, the opposite. Um, so it suggests, uh, the rules suggest lowering percentiles by 10% if talking to someone one class above or 20% if two classes above uh, with no modification if they're the same. And similarly, uh, they mention, for example, criminals usually have some contempt for nobles. And um, in the game, uh, remember, Call of Cthulhu is not really about leveling up your character. And equally, changing your social status in the game should only happen, either up or down, should only happen by a really exceptional incident. Um, so after that... Um, it mentions that the standard rules for occupations uh, from Call of Cthulhu can be used with little to no changes, um, but there are 11 new occupations here. Uh, there is the adventurous, who is someone who, a uh, woman, who is admired by someone of a higher class, and essentially she can adopt their, um, their, cla their higher class level until she is dumped. Um, and it gives the example of Irene Adler from uh, Sherlock Holmes from a scandal in Bohemia. Uh, there's also an aristocrat, clergyman, uh, consulting detective. And they differentiate consulting detective. Um, it, they make it clearly different from an inquiry agent or a private detective. Because uh, investigations are more intellectual in pursuit and generally for upper class clients. 
Uh, there's also ex-military, uh, explorer, an inquiry agent, which is just the same as a private eye, an inventor, uh, official police, and rogue. And the final one is street Arab or urchin. Um, now, I'm from Ireland, and a lot of this uh, lingo is from uh, England. I had never heard the term street Arab before, um, but it just means a street urchin or a homeless person or a beggar. Uh, so I looked it up in Collins Dictionary, and it shows that it was never really a very popular term, but um, the majority of its uses was in the, in the 1880s. Um, and with a brief surge in 1995, 1945, um, for some reason. And it, it seems that the term comes from the perceived nomadic lifestyle of some uh, Arabic people at the time. Um, I would be surprised if this appeared in the seventh edition, um, the new uh, forthcoming edition of Call of Cthulhu, uh, or Cthulhu by Gaslight. Um, just based on it possibly being an offensive term. Um, but yeah, just keepers, keep an eye on this. Um, if it's going to offend your players, obviously leave it out. Um, if they want to use the realism um, of the term that was used at the time, you can throw it in. Uh, but personally, I think that street urchin serves just as well without any risk. And actually this class, uh, the, this wording was removed in the third edition. And interestingly, it wasn't replaced with Street Urchin or anything like that, but that's probably because that was already in the Keeper's Guide at the time. Um, after that, there are a couple of small notes about uh, adopting other occupations from the Keeper's Book, um, particularly changing some of the base stats. Um, and after that, for in the still character creation section, we get a very small section on weapons. Um, you get a little bit on hand-to-hand -hand weapons, handguns, rifles, um, machine guns, and explosives. But mostly it's just a description of what would have been available at the time and how to adapt um, from the Keeper's book. Um, there's very few stats available there. Uh, after that, we get a longer section about England in the 1890s. And we start off actually with world politics and England's place in it. Um, but it also has subsections about uh, places in Europe, the Americas, the Far East, mostly China and Japan, and finally the Eastern Mediterranean and Africa. Um, and after that, there is a timeline of important events from the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, and after that, we get a few small biographies of some famous people at the time who were around at the time. And your characters could meet them if you wanted to. Um, but some keepers don't like to mix the real life characters and uh, fictional char uh, the fictional story. Um, but they're there if you want to use them. If you don't want to use them, you can easily just change a name and then it's, it's close enough. So just for example, on some of the uh, real life personalities that they, that appear here, um, there's Lewis Carroll, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, Arthur Mackin, and Oscar Wilde, among many others. Uh, so after that, we get a discussion about London's location. Uh, first, there's an overall briefing, and then it discusses the general areas of London before giving a list of some of the more specific locations in London. The largest description uh, being of the British Museum, which also has a floor plan. Um, but some places get very little description. Uh, for example, um, Gray's Inn is simply described as one of the inns of the court. That's it. Um, so uh, there's a bit of variation between um, some of them that get the big treatment like the British Museum and Gray's Inn, which is almost forgotten about. And after that, we also get a very short list of some select stores, mostly just names, locations, and opening hours. Uh, but some of them have a little bit more detail. And then we move on to travel. Um, first, we talk about international travel and then within the city. Um, there are a lot of boats that frequent the various piers along the Thames. Uh, there are horses and horse-drawn carts. Um, and it says that the most common form of transport was the two-wheeled handsome and the four-wheeled handsome as well. 
Um, there's a good deal of information about them and the fairs. Um, bicycles were starting to become popular around this time, um, towards the end of this period, uh, but there were no automobiles apparently in London until 1896. Uh, but there was a great subway system, the Underground, uh, with conventional trains, um, not uh, not electric trains, but thus it was very smoky and sooty down, down there. Uh, so electric trains did start to replace them in 1890, but they weren't fully replaced until the start of the new century. century. And next up, we have some information about communication and medias, um, how to use telegrams, um, but you can also use telephone and post and paid messengers. Um, also, newspapers uh, will be giving their daily uh, extras, which can be very thematic as well. Um, after that, there's, a, I think, an excellent section on criminals, where it discusses criminal slang with a whole page dedicated to it, and criminal etiquette, along with uh, safe houses and tools of the trade, uh, discusses prostitution, and the fact that uh, drug use and sale were all legal. And you can just buy cocaine at a chemist. And there were, of course, uh, very thematically, opium dens everywhere. Um, so the natural follow-on from uh, criminality is talking about the law. And it points out that the famous Scotland Yard did not control all of England or even all of London at the time. But the city had its own force, the city police. Um, but of course, these two um, law enforcement organizations did cooperate together. Um, for police procedures, there was no fingerprinting, um, just long, hard hours for the policeman. Um, for minor offences, the trial could be done uh, pretty much immediately in a police station. Uh, if it required a proper trial, um, there was a longer and more complex uh, process, and they would probably uh, any characters involved with this or any accused would probably need a barrister whereas solicitors handle all non-criminal dealings. And after that, we also get a list of some famous detectives at the time, and then some uh, kind of miscellaneous sections uh, talking about like clothing, the cost of living, uh, the government, royalties and titles, uh, and so on. Um, and of course, the London fog is very important. Um, and after that, we talk about uh, the occult in the 1890s, uh, talking about the interest in Egypt and Atlantis were um, high and Neo-Druidism was coming back into fashion. There's a section on Theosophy, Freemasonry, uh, the Golden Dawn, which we'll talk about more in another video, and Spiritualism. Uh, finally, there is a short note about prices and a few pages uh, worth of tables for weapons, tools, clothes, transportation, and with a few pictures of clothes at the time for inspiration, which I, I really appreciate the pictures just to help uh, imagine what you would pair together and what it would look like. I think that's great for the keeper and for the players. So. Now, in section three, we talk about time travel. So there is a short uh, explanation that most Call of Cthulhu games at the time of this printing, um, most scenarios took place in the 1920s. And I would say, even now, the majority of games take place in the 1920s. Although we do also have rules for 1930s, for modern day, um, and of course these um, gaslight rules. But maybe you're playing a game uh, in the 1920s and you want to keep the same characters and switch to a different time period in uh, Cthulhu by Gaslight. So it suggests three methods for time travel. Um, first, magical travel by gate. Second, psionic time travel by mental projection. And third, scientific time travel by time machine. So the first of them uses, at the time, was a new spell called Time Gate. Uh, it cost six to seven magic points uh, for the suggested trip going from the 1920s to the 1890s. But there's rules for different uh, periods as well. And an equal and permanent loss of power. Now, this was, of course, much more expensive in the earlier versions of Call of Cthulhu. Um, where your stats were uh, ranked up to 20. 
as opposed to up to 100. Um, so that loss would be five times greater in the seventh edition. Um, and of course, there's also um, some extra sanity loss as well. So basically, someone, um, presumably not a character, a uh, player character, would cast the Time Gate spell and your players would be transported back to the, ni- the 1890s. Um, the reason I said presumably not one of your players is that um, that's going to be a huge cost, huge magic point cost and huge loss of power. Um, so it will be very difficult um, and maybe a little bit unreasonable for any one of your players to um, sacrifice so much. So the second method is psionic time travel, which is similar to what you would see in the Shadow Out of Time. And only the great race can do it, but they might send the players through the time travel. Um, Players will suffer 1d6 sanity loss, and the player arrives in a random body at the time. And it says that the player has no choice in the matter. It's all up to the keeper. Um, And... Uh, you can choose anything you want. You can uh, change specifically gender, species, and the age could all be different. And some of your physical stats will change to match the new body, but your intelligence, your power, your education, your sanity, and your magic points um, will stay with your character's original characteristics. And while the investigators are back in this time, the owners of the past body are switched into the 1920s and who knows what they might get up to. I think that is uh, one of the best points about time travel. In general, I'm not a huge fan of using time travel um, like this, but just that. Um, If you've got in-depth character development going on, that this mind switch, um, the person from the past transported to the future, Um, might be messing up their characters' lives in 1920s. I think that's very interesting. And finally, um, time machines is the third method for that. Um, And this is a mechanical time machine um, from stories and movies like The Time Machine. I don't think it needs to be explained much further than that. And then in this section, it talks about some of the anachronistic problems that the players may face, such as wearing unusual clothes, having fake money, and some linguistic differences as well. Uh, It's an interesting point that um, shoelaces and neckties were not commonplace before the 1920s. Um, And then after that, we get a little bit of uh, discussion about paradoxes, uh, which is important with time travel. So, um, in my opinion, uh, some of the ideas here are interesting, but I think that uh, a lot of it is not really applicable to the games that I play. Uh, If I'm going to play a Gaslight scenario, I probably want my players to make their own Gaslight characters so they can enjoy the experience more. Um, In particular, I don't love the idea of the um, Keeper just transporting them to a random body um, and changing a lot of aspects about them um, it can be good if the keeper plays it well but I think the idea behind this is that it would be a shocking change but the more shocking a change is uh, played up for a joke I think the less uh, fun it would be for players um, that's just my two cents um, if I were playing that way, I would probably let them choose the body that they inhabit. Um, so uh, out of game metagaming, they would create a Gaslight player connected to their 1920s player. Uh, if I wanted to randomize it, I would probably make um, pre-gen characters and let them just choose randomly. And although I haven't had a TPK yet uh, playing in Call of Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu is very deadly. And players will die, of course, so I'm not sure it's such a big hurdle that you have to force your 1920s characters into the past. You could just wait for them to die and start a new scenario in the 1890s. 
And finally in this section, as the book does acknowledge, the players having time travel abilities can create a lot of unnecessary problems. So uh, do think about that carefully. Certainly if you're giving them the ability to cast, for example, time gate or to have a physical time machine, you have to deal with the consequences that they have that ability now. And so finally, we get into section four, scenario ideas. Um, so these are ideas using um, literature of the time, uh, particularly Sherlock Holmes and H.G. Wells. Um, the Sherlock Holmes timeline basically goes through a list of all his cases and the years and the key outline points of it. Um, it suggests that through um, another adventure, for example, the Yorkshire Horrors, um, the investigators should befriend Sherlock so they can help him more on further on future cases. Um, for H.G. Wells, we start with um, stats and a description for creatures like uh, Morlocks and the Martians and um, the uh, tripods from War of the World, the, the Martian war machines. Um, then there is a breakdown of the information shared on the radio each day about the Martian invasion. Um, so for me, I thought this was a little bit unnecessary. Um, it's just a short recap of some famous works and there's not really a lot to connect it to gameplay. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are many keepers out there who don't want to use um, uh, people like H.G. H. Wells, real life characters um, in their fiction. And similarly, there are many people who don't want to use fictional characters from another universe. So Sherlock Holmes is in the Sherlock universe as opposed to the Cthulhu Mythos universe um, because uh, crossing over those two genres can maybe uh, ruin the immersion for some people. Um, so overall, I didn't think this was particularly a strong section. But that is where we come to the end of the book, um, apart from the scenario of the Yorkshire Horrors. And I will do a separate video talking about the Yorkshire Horrors now for Keepers Only. So this was the first book. Well, I'm sorry, this is the second edition, but only two years after the first edition. Um, introducing Call of Cthulhu to the Gaslight scenario. And I think it is or the Gaslight setting timeline. Um, I think it is very good uh, for an initial attempt, but there are several places where I think it could have been improved. Um, fortunately, a lot of that has been improved in the third uh, edition. And after reviewing the third edition, I will also um, uh, share my ideas uh, for what could be included in the upcoming newest edition, for which will be the fourth edition of Cthulhu by Gaslight for the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu. And hopefully we'll see some of those things. Um, but that's going to be it for today. So thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this or if you had any comments or experiences playing uh, Cthulhu by Gaslight, uh, please leave me a comment down below. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. All right, so that's it for today. So see you next time. Bye.